Untranslatables, this is going to be my topic this evening, are identifiable within the lexicographic turn in theory today, by which I refer to the contemporary critical preoccupation evinced in this conference on the new alphabet with graphology, digitality, data management, dictionary rubrics, and encyclopedic knowledge objects. The English untranslatable, used unconventionally as a substantive rather than an adjective, is itself a kind of misnomer grafted from the French, as Olga said, French intraduisible. The philosopher Barbara Cassin used the term in the subtitle of her monumental Vocabulaire Européen des Philosophies, which I and several co-editors published in English as Dictionary of Untranslatables, and you see that up there, with the subtitle, A Philosophical Lexicon. We seized on the term untranslatable partly because it didn't work in English. When you add the definite article, the untranslatable, it's patently ungrammatical. But that's just the point. In insisting on its weirdness, we hope to set in motion a rethinking of philosophy through the lens of translation. Working with untranslatables was a laboratory experience, one that was fully collaborative. As a mad exercise in translating the untranslatable, the dictionary, through the efforts of many different teams from all over the world, um, has passed now into many languages, among them Russian, Ukrainian, Romanian, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, English, and Arabic. And this is a page from the Arabic edition edited by the philosopher Ali ben Maklouf. The untranslatable in this context and beyond gives full reach to something that would be broadly thought of as ungraspable or inaccessible dimensions of language in the spirit of Walter Benjamin's use of un übersetzbar to describe Hürdelin's strange idiosyncratic German renderings of Sophocles' Greek. For Cassin, the untranslatable was crucial to a practice she called philosophizing in languages. This involved imagining a history of terms or words rather than pure concepts that, became, that become philosophical by virtue of their transit in and across languages. As deterritorialized plurilingual constructs, as political philologies traversing sovereign borders, untranslatables are distinguished by what Cassin calls their energy, their energia, their performativity as symptoms. Premier symptoms include a term's high incidence of mistranslation, retranslation, and non-translation. And when I say non-translation, the classic example would be Heidegger's Dasein, which people often say translates into English as Dasein, uh, rather than some approximate like being there. But the, you can think of many others. This is full of these, are, uh, the dictionary is full of them. So the history of philosophy as a history of what resists or confounds translation offers up a cognitive map marked by voids, ruptures, and breaks rather than connected vectors. Remnants of idiom and dialect, those irritants that Begriffsgeschichte tends to sweep away, are here given their due as elements that change the way we define epistemology, metaphysics, and cognitive science. Theorizing in untranslatables is in this sense synonymous with asking anew some of the old questions. How is philosophy named? How should thought be called? Was heißt denken? At a moment when digital languages, AI, powerful search engines, and blockchains are blurring distinctions between natural languages and code, substituting, if you will, an algorithmic baseline for a philological one. As we enter the era of what my co-editor Jacques Lesra calls Google Translates Time, the babblefish epoch, characterized by, quote, a differing key of value to time and to labor, a different indexing of labor to human action, intention, 
body and, as a result, a different concept of the human altogether. And as we move from rational choice and regimes of maximal calculability to hypothetical orders of the cognitive non-conscious, this is Catherine Hales's expression, the cognitive non-conscious, we might say that theorizing in untranslatables is itself a gathering term for the denominations of the unthought as such. Branching out in another direction, theorizing in untranslatables implies forging political concepts that have as yet no name, no standing in canonical or classical political theory. Uh, and this was the, sorry about the horrible slide, um, this was the, what I was up to in that last book that Olga mentioned, Unexceptional Politics, where I experimented with a vocabulary of micropolitics, things that don't have a kind of political science or political theory traction, uh, terms like disentrenchment, interference, obstinacy, thermocracy, schadenfreude, uh, all of these I was saying is a kind of lexicon of psychopower that doesn't normally get discussed fully in structural accounts of the political. Languaging, I use your term, languaging the political, becomes a way of remapping the field of ordinary politics. And I recently came across a wonderful short text by the poet Anne Carson that gives you a sense of what I'm thinking about. It's a, it's a, uh, a phrase that she borrows from a translator. Uh, the, the term is the dream deem, uh, a kind of oniric demos or phantom of democracy or political inceptionism, if we wanted to use computer speak, hatched from a translation of Homer and glossed by Carson herself. And I won't read it all, but she's, you can see in the, she, she finds this phrase in the 24th book of Homer's Odyssey. Uh, and her friend, Stanley Lombarda, the translator, translates it, the dream deem. And then she has this wonderful kind of languaging. So how would this work? Is it a big file catalog with all the dreams waiting in alphabetical order to go appear inside some head at night? or standing around easy with drinks and anecdotes, or so bored with signifying they're lying on the ground in heaps? Do they have a gift shop? Does it sell books by Adorno? And on and on. I particularly like this image of the file catalog with its possible worlds of democracy milling around in the narrator's head. The arresting image of a dictionary of democracy that recognizes that Democracy itself is an untranslatable term that could be identified with the very structure of grammar. Is it this or that? Is it this or that? What Renata, Renata Sales calls our unhealthy obsession with choice. Is it this or that? This will kind of serve as a header for what, um, what follows here, which is a kind of list or outline of speculative prompts um, that are far from exhaustive, but they give you some sense of how I'm thinking about untranslatable, untranslatability theory today. So the first would be, um, and I, this is not the full list, but just to give you some, what I was talking about at the beginning, the lexicographic turn, the new enlightenment, the valorization of knowledge alphabets, dictionaries, lexicons, vocabularies, data mining programs, uh, we could group under this, and again, I'm just passing over it, Charles Sanders' purses, general predicates of thought, transmitted through formal icons, diagrams, and schematic images. Um, the preoccupation with unipolar languages, monological or pan-translatable. Systems of information, storage, and refining. These are the new diagrams of how knowledge is organized. That's a data refinery, so you can see that schematically they have these analogies. This I picked from the glossary of uh, data management, data mining glossary, and you can see that it takes from two areas, this new language takes from the area of um, the extractive industries, overburden, um, where you would be moving topsoil around, and uh, this becomes grafted onto information management, and um, 
The other, sorry, uh, the other would be, say, uh, the, the language that business speaks, best practices, optimization, globish, what Keller Easterling has called the patois of management tees. And, and, and this, you could say, uh, has led to the fetishization of a, of a kind of logos of machine translation or the algorithmic trib, the pulsion, underlying hyper-instrumental communication. Okay, this, the next section I, I would call alphabetic symptoms. Uh, these could include an alphabetic unconscious understood as that which overdetermines the processing of random notations as a script with the Aleph, the first letter, uh, as uh, having a, a, a status of firstness. It's how you read uh, something in order, right? In alphabetical order, how that ordering takes place. The other question would get into elisions of distinctions between alphabetic letter and stroke or pixel or point. Um, units of information that induce illegibility blur, low def, or out of focus images, immaterialization, and I show you here one of Thomas Hirschhorn's pixel collages where he's playing around with units of visual abstraction. Here's another one. Uh, or my friend Mary Kelly, who uses a, a technique that's different, but this is an image of that famous uh, Marianne of 1968, who's carrying the banner, she's on the shoulders, but you can barely make out this historic image because of the way it's been, uh, the, the units of visual information have been blown up. The whole question, I would say, of alphabetizing faces that has come up with uh, new softwares of pattern recognition, uh, softwares that have turned out to recognize non-white persons uh, much less well, so they're cued to recognizing whiteness, uh, and which becomes in, indirectly linked to the politics of non-recognition. These are uh, questions raised by Hito Sterl in uh, Duty Free Art. Um, and then things like letters moving on a board. This is uh, from a, the cover of a book by the architect Peter Eisenman called Faints. Uh, it's a diagram of players moving on a soccer pitch. And um, you could even group under this alphabetic symptom the problem of information jamming or hack, the glitches that impede translation, the missed encounter between critical theory and cybernetics, which is the main thesis of Lydia Liu's book, The Freudian Robot, Digital Media and the Future of the Unconscious. Um, and then I would also include under this the problem of transmedial perceptions, the reading, the listening, the looking, the touching, uh, some of which has been, of course, brilliantly explored by uh, Jean-Luc Nancy's notion of a philosophical or phenomenological sensorium. And then I'll touch briefly on this idea of a, a Baroque alphabetics, which um, I take from Akira Lippert, who is talking about film characters who function almost as heterogeneous phonemes of cinematic narrative or language. And his examples are from David Lynch, the quasi-human baby of a racer head, the night porter in the elephant man, uh, and virtually every character in Twin Peaks. Uh, he, he says these are the characters who have deficits of subjectivity. They belong nowhere. Um, how am I doing for time? I have not too much more, but that's okay. Oh, five? Mm, all right. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to throw out a term that I've been, I was talking with a math mathematician recently. Um, indifferentism. Indifferentism. This term, and this is a complicated idea, and I only will just throw it out there, but it's, I will give you an example of what I mean. So this is a term coined by a mathematician, John Burgess, to uh, apply to what he, quote, the general phenomenon of indifference of working mathematicians to certain kinds of decisions that have to be made in any codification of mathematics. So in other words, 
The examples would be things like real numbers, zero-one laws, recursive function, terms that are used that link mathematical formulas to logic, but which are in, many, in some ways false. They don't actually apply. They're, they're analogical. They're not referential. And uh, I would say that, making a big leap here, that the whole vocabulary of intelligence operates that way. So, for example, we have these expressions um, where computer science commonly entangles the vocabulary of program with the vocabulary of intelligence, computer memory, machine learning, artificial intelligence, um, smart technologies, deep neural networks. Um, all of these metaphors from Turing to Kurzweil to Dreyfus indicate an in, what I would say is an indifference to the pathetic fallacy that arises with the assignment of cognitive function to machine processing. The phenomenon is sometimes called the ELISA effect, uh, referring to a phrase manipulator that was given the identity of a psychotherapist in the early days of machine translations of feelings. Machinic intelligence, I'm suggesting, is a translation into the language of human understanding of programming, algorithmic word clustering, outputting, and um, pattern recognition that's automatized. And the point here really is that AI has no other mode of representing how it thinks. Uh, a similar problem besets references to the language of DNA. Who decided DNA was a language? How did it, be, it become standard practice in the life sciences to, as Lydia Liu has argued, recast the biochemical processes of the living cell as coded messages, information transfer and communication flow, and from thence to effectively allow alphabetical writing to shed its old image of phonetic symbolism to be the speechless inscription of the genetic code. Is it linguistic by analogy to natural languages or simply by virtue of the fact that humans have naturalized the metaphor? So in a way I'm saying that DNA is a kind of alphabet soup of life um, or a code name, a code name for uh, the secret in the body, the fantasy structure of genes and brains. A line from the poet Safiya Sinclair uh, says it best. She says, what the body speaks is untranslatable. Uh, and I may have to end with this rather than continuing, but the idea of morphing intelligence, this is the title of a book by Catherine Malabou on the process of epigenesis. It follows on her controversial earlier treatise, which we see on the left, What Should We Do With Our Brain? Malabu alerts us to the importance of translation as a metaphor used to describe aspects of the genetic code, as in the language of the genome or epigenetics, coined in the early 40s by the biologist C.H. Waddington with reference to, quote, the study of the causal interactions between genes and their products which bring the phenotype into being. So this language is broadly applied today to the ways in which random mutation is assimilated into the genome. Homing in on how certain interpretive molecules, note that language, interpretive molecules, such as interfering RNA, can alter the appearance and structure of the phenotype's expression by inhibiting, de-differentiating, or de programming certain parts of the genetic sequence or code such that certain genes, such as cancer genes, are silenced, another language term, right? Silencing of genes. Malibu links this interpretive function to her own notion of plasticity or self-transformation. For Malibu, epigenetics translates between the highly polarized disciplines of neuroscience and philosophy. Okay, I, I wanted to get to the Willard Qu Van Orman Quine's Gavagai. Uh, I won't really have time for that, but it's an invented term for that which cannot be translated. Uh, drawing on a scene of ethnographic imperialism, he imagines the ethnologist in the field 
conjecturing on the basis of minimal information gleaned from a native informant what the meaning of the word gavagai might be. Is it a whole rabbit or some qualia of rabbitness, a time slice of rabbit, a set of moving rabbit parts, the event of rabbiting, the idea of rabbit hood? Uh, and this wonderful, uh, this was from another section called Philosophy and Language, Meaning and Sense. And the Gavagai for me is, I'll, I think I'll end here with, is a kind of quintessential untranslatable. It's an invented term. Um, and I got alerted to it because there's a film uh, that has Gavagai as the title. Um, it's by Rob Tregenza. And it's about um, a, a man whose wife is a translator, uh, in, and, and she dies, right? Um, she, what's funny? <laughs> is there some joke I've missed? <laughs> um, so it's about these two men who, um, the one confronting his grief, uh, and in the rain on a cliff overlooking an expanse of forest, the main character rips up his late wife's translations of the Norwegian writer Tarje Vesas and flings them into the wind. His anger, destructive and futile, seems to compound his wife's death by destroying what's left of her work. Um, and it's been said by one critic that the poems haunt Gavagai in this confrontation with the void. And I'm just, so I will end with this poem from the, this poet, a uh, Norwegian writer, uh, from Journey, Reisa. At last we emerged from the mist, night mist. No one recognized anyone now. The faculty was lost on the journey. No one asked or demanded, who are you? We couldn't have answered. We had lost our names. Far away, hammered, an unbending heart still at work. We listened without understanding. We had come farther than far. Thank you.